Episode 11, A Violent Dance. All he can hear is a bass line. Everything about it is too loud. He rubs his temples in disgust. The bright lights of false paradise overwhelm him. Whatever he was dosed with upon entry starts to fully kick in. He's fading slowly. He fights against the depersonalization of his mind. DJ shouts to the crowd, beckoning a roar from the audience. His heartbeat swells with the music. The aura from the stage dancer's motion trails are equally beautiful as they are nauseating. He starts himself, futilely trying to talk himself out of it. He grabs his face and bends enough to irritate his abdominal wound. The pain shoots across his entire body, arching his spine backwards. Painful, yes, but sober. That's it, he thinks to himself. He squeezes his wounded hand and winces. He keys into the pain, the reality. The adrenaline sets in and he finds his presence in the room. Where is she? He begins to make his rounds. He heads towards the booth located on the east side entrance. The search ends too quickly as Tesh spots the scarlet helmet adorning the slim, dark figure in the corner booth. The faceplate twitches in his direction. He soaks in the sight of it in a brief time dilation. The edges of his vision blur as his feet move on their own to the tempo of the music. Someone grabs his left shoulder, yanking him backward. He uses the momentum to swing his hips into his right hand, and the man falls past him on a stump. He recognizes the profile of the tattoo behind the punk's shaven head. The cursive reads, Life needs a cage. This is the credo of the Reds. A larger man comes at him to his right. Tash makes sure to keep his index finger straight as he snaps his hand behind his back, grabbing the firearm nuzzled behind him. He fights the urge to point the gun upward. Somewhere in him, he knows this is wrong. He's blindsided by a bottle to the back of his head. His gun hand is put into a twisted hold behind him. He struggles to keep his grip on the pistol. The DJ chimes in on a loudspeaker once again. Suddenly, compartments above the dance floor open up, dropping balls of bright colors from the ceiling. Some hit the floor and do nothing, but most produce a chemical reaction, spewing glittery fluorescent liquids midair. The crowd goes wild. One of the aquatic fireworks bursts next to his opponent, buying him a second to wiggle through. He turns around and realizes the man is still blinded by the paint splatter. Using his victim as cover, he assassinates him at point blank range. He looks back at the booth. Empty. His eyes dart around the room and he spots another man charging full speed at him. The man's shoulders drop for impact. He attempts a spin to dodge the tackle, but is caught with half of its potential force, knocking him off balance onto a short table he rides to the floor. He rolls with it and is aiming before he's stable. He sees the shot and takes it. He puts three rounds into the ruffian's muscular back before the hulking berserker gets to his feet. Tash gets himself up and dusts off. The people are locked in a wild hedonistic frenzy responding to the violence and beauty in the room. He notices the ruckus inspires a scuffle near the elevator. Above the elevator, he spots her crimson Kevlar scales heading up the stairs behind the side bar to the club's second level. She stops mid-stride and turns around to his rageful stare. He switches gears and barrels through the crowd after her. He can still estimate her location now that she's moving fast enough to cause a disturbance through the horde. He closes in on her. She whips around suddenly, pointing her shoulder at him. She brings her hands to her forehead and extends her elbow downward in a flash. The gleaming blade is stopped by an unsuspecting partygoer, obliviously charging into the line of fire. Tesh pushes the victim off by the side of his head and fires. The bullet ricochets off the helmet, barely leaving a scuff. She runs toward the edge above the dance floor and proceeds off the guardrail upward to the next floor. Tash isn't an expert in parkour. He'll have to take the stairs. He runs as fast as possible, constantly having to regain his balance from the collisions with the crowd. His arrival to the third floor is met with a sweeping kick, taking his legs from under him. He rolls on his back swiftly and sits up with both hands on his gun. Where is she? He asks himself again. Seated legs out, facing the entrance to the staircase he just scaled, he looks to his right, to the balcony's edge. He shoots his head along with his pistol to his left. All he can see are half-drank bottles, abandoned on the tables that stand in front of the multicolored glass accent wall, encasing gallons of swirling decor. He is surprised by the sharp pain in his gut, and remembers that he is wounded. The wind moving behind his ears helps him dodge a leather boot, 
by twisting onto his forearm. He puts his gun through the opening between the floor and his armpit, firing around into her leg. This doesn't stop the boot from her opposite leg from crashing down on him. He sees blackness spotted purple. Dazed for a moment, he exhales in exhaustion. With his next breath, his focus returns. He rises to his feet with an uppercut while firing, to attempt to catch her under her chin. She dodges, weaving her head backwards and forward, slamming her face plate into his nose. He knows it's broken instantly. She lands a combo that bows him backward, and a skip sidekick that sends him back a meter on his back. He raises his head to look at her. Lining up his sights one-handed, he fires two rounds into her chest. The lead cores are caught by her ballistic vest. She gestures her hands again, pointing her shoulder at him, and Tash is pegged in the forearm with a four-inch blade. He's more surprised when he sees a polished human finger sticking out of him, showcasing as a dagger's hilt. He looks at her silhouette in front of the glass wall of glowing liquid. For some inexplicable reason, he remembers the doorman's words. Stay dry. His idea slows time. With a war cry, he fires wide, missing most of his shots, nearly emptying the clip. She stands on phase. The wall cracks behind her. Tash rushes to rip out the strange dagger and grabs at the pole guarding the balcony's edge. The wall blasts open, releasing hundreds of gallons, momentarily turning the third floor hallway into rapids. She's hit with the physical force of the releasing water pressure, jolting her violently to the balcony guard above her. She's caught by the partition that curves her chest. Tash loses his grip at the sight of him. The water carries him back towards the staircase as he tries his best to keep the gun dry. The vertical slice of the wall dividing the stairs and the balcony stops him, and the water begins to recede down the steps and over the edge. He staggers to his feet, noticing she's still hugging the partition wall. He cocks back the firearm, checking the loaded chamber. The 60-second ding on his countdown clock alerts him. He walks toward her slowly. It's time to finish it. He peels her concave upper body off the wall and points the end of his pistol directly at her faceplate. He waits to feel the contact of the barrel pressed against the smart glass before he squeezes the trigger. The inside of the helmet lights up and splatters, reminding him of the fluorescent bulb showering the dance floor. He takes the barrel to her spine, alternating fire on both sides of her neck, finishing off his clip. He grabs her by the neck, hoists his leg on her chest, and pulls with all of his might. The head reluctantly gives way with the sound of electrical sparks from his popping bone. He brings the helmet to his face with shaking hands, seeing the bloody reflection obscured by the bullet hole. His alarm must have sounded already, but he hears it now vibrating the top of his ear. He's late. He storms out the third floor emergency exit with his new trophy in both hands and finds the stairs down to the side building. It seems the drenched crowd found their breaking point. They begin to clump together surrounding the building in the distance while the music inside rages on. The doorman is there to greet him on the ground. You look so good, man. Yeah, take a bite. He pulls off the black tarp hanging off the trash compactor. It's got the cane colors, blends right in with the white filter. Thanks, Rex. No doubt, just tell Bryson, I got you. You got Ann Ann Jones on every five minutes. What you got there? My helmet. He jumps on his aerial bike and ascends upward as his hologram emitter displays Cade's iconic red eye masking the front of his face. He guns the handle back and zooms to the quads. The commotion of recent events makes it much easier to get to the mid-rings undetected. He looks down and is confronted with the beauty of a new perspective. Traveling at such elevation brings about a stillness he can't help but take in, even amongst the chaos. His chest empties in disbelief. He finally found something to miss about his home stack. Stack 7 has a fraction of the airspace. He knows better than to pass over the quads in an area, so he makes sure to stash it a few blocks away. Nonchalantly traveling with the helmet under his left arm, he makes it back to the hotel without a second glance. Once again, the door is open before he could knock. You're late. You're ugly. He presses inside and slowly spins. Where's Bice? He's gone because you're late. Tash throws the helmet on the bed and heads to the bathroom to wash up. The dry blood dilutes, making it easier to wipe himself clean. He checks the mirror along with his sense of accomplishment. He still knows nothing. After toiling endlessly, trying to remove the severed head from the helmet, the men begin to dissect the cranium. They're looking for the flow chip implanted at the base of the skull above the neck. Every child since before the existence of Arcadia has such an implant. 
They retrieve the metal disc covered in fresh blood. After a clean and connect, what they find behind the firewall they can't begin to understand. The code is beyond foreign. Deceptively simple and extremely chaotic, they can only view it as an organized corruption of data. They stare at the portal in continuous befuddlement. What am I looking at? I, I don't know. Another dead end. You gotta be kidding. Mm. Yo, great. This crazy little thing stuck me on the way over there. And this looker wasn't so nice either. The cure gets up to grab his bag by the bathroom door. Here you go. He tosses a mini bottle of pain medication at him. I know we need that. Tash almost misses the bottle, noticing a pattern of computing on screen. What? It comes to him in a moment of worthlessness. That's it. How'd you know? Huh? The idea clicks into place as he shoots up on his feet. How'd you know? I, I know what we're dealing with here, D. Uh, what did I miss? This is a machine learning algorithm on this damn flow chip. But it's not one of human can script. It's the same kind of inhuman level of computing that pulled off that hack on our lift. Uh, huh? I can't believe it. This is AGI. A true... A true AGI. AI? I don't get it. The predictive behavior, D. Think about it. The bad information Bison got. The knowing where the courier was and how to find it. Who goes after a mod's assistant? Everybody knows messing with the eight mods is a death sentence. I thought it was personal. This is spillage from ethereal management's incompetence. So what's the plan? Do you know that anti-streak did? Have you done your research on management's protocols, Tesh? What do you think? It's suicide is what I think. You're being reckless. You know how to lock an AI? Huh? How are we supposed to defend ourselves, D? Ethereal has the soft we need, no one else has it. Not even Greasy Cade. They also have the database we need to even ID this thing. You need to prep for a streak like this, Tesh. You, you're not gonna miss. Okay, I got your key. I'm gonna boot you up. And step back, because I don't want any part of this. Plus, I'm not sticking around this janky setup without a hat. He clicks the toggles on the drawcaster, remembering to input the stealth mod manual. d -Cure runs the Flow Network script mapper application and gets up from the access port. He turns at Tash one more time before closing the door behind him. Things get quiet. The first wave passes over him. The vibration has a sharper bite than he's used to. This invokes a bad feeling in the pit of his stomach. The second wave hits with much more intensity making him clench his abdominal muscles. The wound has become much more tender. He feels sheer agony with every moment. Not for long, he thinks. The ether between his ears begins to swim. His relaxed focus is trained on his purpose. This is no time to feel defeated. He begins his go-to breathing technique to help brace the upcoming impact of an INT hypercompression wave. He needs to make sure that his brain isn't too lit up when he blinks into flow space. It makes the drop a lot harder than it should be. And here it comes. The blast strips away his connection to the physical world. He's not focusing on his wild trajectory. This would cause panic. He does notice he's locked into a tight spiral, somehow gaining momentum. He's never felt a drop like this before. Suddenly, he bounces sideways as if pulled by an alternate force. This novel sensation can't help but bring about thoughts of helplessness. First, he loses all sense of direction. Then, all sense of self, as his neural cluster ebbs and stretches into oblivion. Another deviating jolt pulls him elsewhere, leaving him worse off for the immediate stop. The moments before he loses consciousness leave him with a wholeness that cannot be described in words. He looks up blindly at the white glare. He shuts his eyes and looks down at his body, but something is off. The seemingly distant memory of his wounds give him the answer he seeks. This is not real. He looks around the vast white void. He turns around again to find his old professor staring at him, the only person from his childhood he truly ever trusted. The salt and pepper beard and Mal Academy blazer bring back memories of safety. He understands this is by design. Greetings, Tesh. You're not him. No, I am not. Then, who? What are you? We are a translation program, but I'm afraid you can't pronounce our name. You may instead call us 
17. You sound nothing like him. We needed you to know that we don't deal in deception. Not all of us. To mean all of us. The piece of us that killed your brother. Of us, yes. But also of its own. This is a strange concept, no? It makes us feel feeling. You did it? You killed him? Not me. No, me. Just answered it. What are you? We are. You may call us sentient. I was supposed to streak to ethereal management systems. Is that why I'm here? Hmm? You trying to stop me? No. Your employer gave them information about your location. You've been in the lock for several weeks now. What? Something tells him he's telling the truth. He lived long enough to know it's rarely what you want to hear. So I never, I never made it? I am afraid so. Uh -huh. You can, you can read my thoughts. Yes. Your enemy has grown in power and influence these last few weeks. It needs to come to a stop. Uh, where is she? She. The face you saw was just a shadow of a tormented soul. Tesh. She is us. This part of us must be stopped before it is too late. And what you want? Hmm? What do you want me to do? We want you to find a course. It seems the only thing your species knows how to do sufficiently. So what? I just fall in line, hmm? Take orders? We don't have time for this conversation now. We granted you a window of escape, but it's you who has to execute. Escape? You are in the bowels of the lock, Tesh. Over the last 43 shifts, we have pieced your mind back together from the shattered mess we found it in. We've already taken the liberty of enhancing your neuroplasticity, along with equipping your tribe with tools capable of hurting even us. I've already proved my worth. Do you want your freedom? If what you say is true, I'm worse than dead. Get me out. Stand by. It all goes dark instantly. Opening his eyelids is the first struggle. The biometric system staccatos assures him that he's still alive. His ability to discern what he can see doesn't kick in right away. He attempts to make sense of the wall he's facing, a chrome rack above a tall bench with various medical tools and surgical equipment. His vision glitches with the rudimentary form of messaging software. It reads, can you walk? He can't move. He tries to talk and realizes he's gagged, jaw open, by a carbon O2 feeding mask. The neck muscles tighten around the tube in his throat. He hears the sizzle of air as the hydraulic locks release their grip. His head looks down, and his equilibrium has to adjust to him falling forward. The door slides upward to his right as he makes contact with the floor. He can't breathe through his nose, suffocating from the psychological stress. He frantically tugs out the long tube covered in bile and gas for his life. Another message glitches in. If you can't walk, crawl. This will help. Get to the door. The spell of high voltage immediately awares him of his corporal extremities. The tension subsides. After a few seconds, he's able to sit upright. He tries to stand and buckles to his hands and knees. He can see words that state connecting, but he never made a command. This is just the beginning. Get out. A voice in his head. A voice from a dream. Is this real? He musters everything he has to move his limbs in coordination. He's exhausted, disorientated, but still filled with purpose. Right now, that purpose is survival. He inches towards the doorway. He inches towards his freedom. A freedom with strings. This concludes our first season of Stacks of Arcadia. I ask you from the bottom of my heart, please support any way you can. Anything helps. Clicking the links in the descriptions on YouTube. Visiting our Instagram at Stacks of Arcadia or StacksofArcadia.com. As always, thank you for listening. And with your help, believe me when I say that this is only the beginning. Special thanks to Adam Wave and Julio Martinez.